participants, welcome to the sixth week and fourth module of our course on literature, culture and media. In this module, so far we have discussed issues related with identity as well as ideology. We have seen how ideology and identity are interconnected and how they can also not be separated from the overall culture which is created in our contemporary world. In this module, we would see how identity is created with the help of literary works. Identity has been defined as a set of characteristics, traits or qualities that make someone different from others. It is an identification of the characteristics which are unique to somebody. The process of individuation is also an integral part of the creation of one's identity because the process of individuation helps us in defining our basic impulses, in understanding our dreams and ambitions in a better way and to combine them with our own personality traits. Identity defines not only the individual, but we have to look at it from the perspective of a group identity also, because the identity of a group also provides the context to an individual. It provides a context to the interpersonal relationships of an individual. An individual cannot live in isolation and therefore, whereas the construction of individual identity is import, important, the social context and the cultural climate is also important for its formation and for imparting a unique flavor to it. Across different groups of people, communities and societies, we find that the identity is being formed not only as a product of individual dreams and aspirations, not only through one's process of individuation, but also we find that the identity is simultaneously being created and transformed through the environment, the social, the political and the cultural environment. In this environment, we find that different aspects related with our color or race and ethnicity, our economic class as well as gender etcetera intersect continually and overwhelmingly with the process of the formation of our identity. Often we find that this connection may not be very explicit, but let us say that it is a part of our personality, it is a part of our makeup and cannot be absolutely and categorically dissociated from it. In the same way we find that in literary discourse and in literary narratives, these connections which issues of race, color, class and gender ethnicity etcetera with have with the formation of identity are also exhibited in complex ways. These factors, for example, the factors of class and race and gender etcetera mold the perception and the concept of the self of the author, but at the same time they also mold the perception and the self concept of the reader. And as we have seen in our discussions of postmodernist theoretical background, it is the perception of the audience which is equally important in internalizing the message of a literary product. So, we can say that these factors underscore those practices which are circumscribed, they are limited within a periphery, they are not universal. And in the same way, our understanding of societal roles and what constitutes a normative behavior in a given circumstances are formed by our constraints and considerations of race, class, gender, ethnicity, etcetera. Literature represents them. The interconnectivity is retained by various literary pieces and communicated in a connotative and suggestive way to the audience. So, we can say that the formation of identity is normally unfolded 
In these contexts or pre-cut grooves of gender, class, race, sexuality as well as ethnicity and nationality. And all these determinants are responsible for the formulation and contestation of identities. Identity itself is a part of a larger institutional or structural force which constitutes sociality. So, certain modes of being and certain identities are privileged over others. During our discussions of gender particularly we have seen how certain types of sexualities are given a hierarchical preference whereas, some other types are not and this in itself constitutes a hierarchy of power in a given societies. So, we find that these identities and privileging one over the other often generates power dynamics and our relationships are also influenced by them. Literature helps us to understand and interrogate these dynamics by explaining the dominant socio-political and cultural forms in many explicit and implicit ways. The word culture can be defined as a range of human activities. Over the period we find that our understanding of the term culture itself has undergone several changes. In the next module, we would be discussing how the word culture has gone through different transformations. But today we understand it as a way of life, as a set of characteristics which belong to a particular group. For example, a particular language, a particular preference for art, literature, religion, even a cuisine for example. It also defines a collective habit in terms of possessing or sharing social beliefs, habits, norms, customs, etcetera. Whereas, culture defines these aspects of our day to day behavior, we find that it also defines our attitudes towards each other, also towards people who are in different power relationships with us. It also defines what type of hierarchies may exist in a given circumstances and how should we assess them and form our own value judgment. Our culture also teaches us to have faith in certain meanings and notions, to prefer certain systems of knowledge in comparison to others. Briefly we can say that our culture is a sum total of our learned human behavior, not only as an individual but also as a member of a particular community or society. It is impossible to define culture in strategic and definitive means. It is a complex yet an abstract and symbolic system. It is a knowledge which is particular to a particular group and this is perhaps the best way to understand it. These definitions of culture also underscore how our identity formation, our understanding of the term identity as an individual as well as as a part of a particular system or society and culture are inextricably linked. Identity is formulated through culture only and here I quote from Hofstede who says that culture is the collective programming of the human mind. The phrase which has been used here is the collective programming, programming as in any computer program. So, according to Hofstede, we find that culture has been defined as a collective programming of the human mind that distinguishes the members of one human group from those of another. And culture in this sense is a system of collectively held values. Edgar Sheen also defines culture at a deeper level as a set of basic assumptions and beliefs that are shared by members of an organization that operate unconsciously and define in a basic taken for granted fashion an organization's view of itself and its environment. So, we find that culture formulates the human identity and our perceptions and our belief systems are also formulated by culture. We can say that culture and identity are interconnected. Culture is like an umbrella term 
under which we can look at different aspects of our lived behavior, different facets of our personality and our societal positioning are also a part of this broad umbrella term. When we look at the linkages which exist between culture and identity and literature, we find that literature though primarily comes under the domain of culture along with certain other areas like music or religion or art, we find that literature also lies within the domain of culture. It at the same time reflects identity and culture. The age old definition of literature being a mirror to the society confirms this impression. At the same time however, paradoxically literature also creates culture, it adds to the existing system of knowledge about human beings and at the same time helps us to internalize certain values in a way that we are able to fashion new values giving yet new dimensions to the existing culture. Identity in literature is presented and formulated in various ways. Primarily we can say that with the help of different narratives, fables, stories etc., literature helps us in understanding the formation of identity. At the same time we find that with the presentation of different characters, with the help of round and flat characters, with the help of those plot structures in which the idea of building Sraman is presented, the personal development arc and transformation of culture also helps us in understanding the formation of identity in a human being. It also represents human nature, the motivations, emotions and feelings in a very suggestive manner. Literature is not only limited to a mere reflection of our ideas and sentiments, but it also narrates the conflict which may exist within the individual between different individuals, individuals and societies between two communities, groups and societies. It also depicts how identity and culture interact with each other and what type of struggles we have to participate in on the basis of gender, race, class, sexuality, ethnicity, etc. At the same time, we find that in various literary motives, different hierarchies and institutional forces are presented as being at the center of these formations. Any good piece of literature helps us to understand the not only the process of individuation, but also the complete process of identity formation. Literature therefore, helps us to understand the cultural struggles as well as the struggles which all of us have to face in the process of the formation of our identity. It also provides us a context to understand these struggles in a cohesive manner. These struggles may be in the shape of socio-political struggles, the cultural strives, the material difficulties etc. But the literary context which is provided to the reader helps us to associate ourselves better to the situation which is being presented. And therefore, literature does not only have the role of a narrator, but it also has an ideological role to play. It also helps us to transform as an individual. And therefore, we find that it documents not only what is, but also what can be and also what should be. And therefore, we find that the relationship of literature with culture is a very intense one. It is also interconnected because whereas it represents culture, it also helps us in shaping the new cultural norms because it presents not only a record of what is, but also the possibilities of what can and also the ethical judgments in terms of what should be. Thus, we can say that literature represents the contemporary world views, the dominant world views as well as not so dominant world views. 
and it also simultaneously represents the inner fractures which run through these dominant structures. It also challenges the notions of dominant culture and hierarchy by bringing into the focus the culture of the subaltern. And therefore, we find that literature is open to diverse possibilities. At the same time, we also have to understand that different authors as well as characters in different works of these authors deal with this issue of identity, what it is and how it is formed in different ways. For example, black female writers like Lord or Maya Anglu or Bell Hooks would deal with the questions of racial and gendered identities differently from their male counterparts and also differently in comparison to the white feminist writers. In the same way, we find that the world view which is presented by a 19th century novelist would be very different from the world view presented by a contemporary 21st century writer. These differences would be there because the circumstances change, the material and historical and social positions would change and they would determine to a large extent the content, the shape of the narrative the technical form of a particular literary genre, the concerns of a particular novelist or a particular poet and also the themes which that author is going to take up. Even though these differences are there and they would always remain there, at the same time we find that there are certain commonalities which exist. A good literary piece is able to transcend the limitations of time and space and would be able to address certain perennial value structures. And that is why we find that true literature never becomes stated. Even though the external situations would change, the material descriptions would change, the themes may also change, but the values which are being suggested in any good piece of literature would always be able to address the audience transcending the limitations of time and space. When we discuss how identity is constructed and presented in a piece of literature, we have to be aware of several things which work simultaneously. Let us say to begin with that authors have a personal identity which is influenced by the world view within which they write. For example, uh, if we take up Margaret Atwood and Ellis Walker, we find that Margaret Atwood is basically Canadian writer, whereas Ellis Walker is African and American writer. Atwood's Handmaid's Tale, which was published in 1985 and Walker's The Color Purple, which was published in 1982, have certain similarities because their authors share common perspectives on certain issues related with gender. But they are also very different in terms of their dealing with the material circumstances because they do not share the same ethnic or national roots. So, let us say that these differences are there, but at the same time commonalities do exist and these commonalities should also not be ignored. Secondly, we can say that the authors develop characters who may not necessarily represent their own circumstances or world view. And here it would be pertinent to quote from the novels of James Sully's featuring Lew Griffin. The writer and character have different identities, Sully is white whereas Griffin has been presented as a black person. So, literature in a way explores complexities and complications of identity. It helps us to understand how identities are formed, charted, explored, demarcated and also challenged and particularly in those circumstances where the boundaries are porous, they are often overlying and contested. It also helps us to understand how these categories which we have referred to earlier come about the categories of race, class, ethnicity, diaspora being 
into exile, multiculturalism, etc. How do they come about and how do they influence us? At the same time, how do they coexist and what can be their relationship with an individual or in a particular situation for the artist, for the readers and also at a much wider scale for the arts themselves. In order to pursue this aspect of the interconnections which exist between literature and identity formation, I have taken up a case study of two women writers. I am taking up these two writers, Virginia Woolf and Shashi Deshpande. And I would review how gender as a tool has been used to define the way identity and related issues are formed and presented for the individual characters as well as within a given social setting. And we would also discuss the commonalities between these two writers and the differences in terms of their approaches. The lifespan of Virginia Woolf is 1882 to 1941. She is a major early 20th century writer. On the other hand, Shashi Deshpande is a major contemporary Indian writer. Born in 1938, she has produced several novels and story collections and has also contributed different essays on various topics. Virginia Woolf is known for the stylistic innovations which she had introduced through her essays and had also tried to explain in her essays. She is considered to be a prominent figure when we talk about the use of a stream of consciousness technique. Along with Joyce and Proust, she has also used a stream of consciousness technique in her novels to lay bare the inner goings on of her characters. Her novels also have basically a lyrical element in them and since we often talk about the other aspects of her technique as well as about the themes related with feminism which she has taken, this aspect of the lyrical quality of her narratives is often uh, put on the back burner, but it is very much there. If we look at Virginia Woolf's work from contemporary standpoint, we find that she has been a major feminist voice. In her expository writings particularly, we find that she moves gradually towards a post-feminist stand. In her essay, Men and Women, which was published in 1920, she has fiercely commented on the absence of a woman's voice in literature, particularly in literature before the 19th century. And she says that before the 19th century, literature was particularly a soliloquy because it had recorded the voice of man only. Even when women characters were presented, the perceptions were that of a man, how does a man views a woman's life to be. So, the woman herself was absent. So, as early as 1920, she was telling us how literature is also a record of the silence of women. She was also one of the first writers to talk about the ameliorating impact of technology on the lives of women. She has recorded the impact of technology in whatever shape it was found in her days on the lives of women. And she has also talked about the changes which have been brought about by the industrial revolution which created a social milieu in which an emancipated woman character could be created by various authors. She has said that characters like Jane Eyre and Isabel Brenners were possible only, a, only in a climate which was created basically by the industrial revolution. Even though their protest was low key and unspecified, the elements of liberal feminism which we find in them would not have been possible without the role of technology. So, we find that Virginia Woolf is one of those early feminists who have talked about the significance of technology for liberating a woman's life. She is also known for her books, A Room of One's Own, which was 
published in 1929 and Three Guinas which was published in 1938. In these books as well as in several other essays which have been penned by her, Wolf has talked about the significance of an independent space for a woman, the significance of education also. The concept of economic independence by and large is only referred to by Virginia Woolf because she has been stopped by her circumstances from dwelling in detail about that. Still we find that along with Bronte and sometimes within quote uh, men's field, she is one of those writers who have been referred to by Simone de Bua in her seminal text, The Second Sex, published originally in 1959 and translated into English in 1961 as those women writers who had the capability to, to portray the life of women in a significant manner. If we compare the works of Virginia Woolf with the works of Shashi Deshpande, we find the presence of several common themes. The narratives may look different because the society they are depicting is different, the material circumstances are also different, the cultural codes in terms of dress and language are also different, but we find that the basic concerns have lots of commonalities and similarities. Shashi Deshpande has been awarded the Padma Shri Award in 2009. Before that, she had won Sahitya Academy Award in 1990 for her novel That Long Silence. She belongs to the second generation of Indian novelists. That is, she has grown up after the work of the three bigs had become popular in the Indian scenario. She is a prolific writer. She has published so far 11 novels, 7 story collections, several books for children, spy novels and several other expository and perceptive essays. Interestingly, we find that in the work of Shashi Deshpande, as we can say in the works of Virginia Woolf, the themes remain unchanged. As we find in Virginia Woolf, we find also in Shashi Deshpande the presence of a lyrical element. These two writers are able to use language in an evocative manner which is almost poetic. The feminist voice is present in Deshpande too and like Virginia Woolf we find that in her novels she gradually moves towards a post feminist stand. She has also taken up issues of higher education like Virginia Woolf. Whereas Virginia Woolf had not been able to take up the idea of economic independence in her novels even though she had started to hint at it in her several essays which were published after her lifetime, she had not been able to talk about the total economic emancipation for a woman because it was still so far away in the contemporary British society. But we find that Deshpande has taken up this theme in the contemporary Indian milieu and has talked at length about it. In terms of her social milieus, Sometimes Deshpande is compared with Jane Austen and we would come to this point later on, but I would like to say that she still has many commonalities with Virginia Woolf. To illustrate the concerns of Virginia Woolf in detail, I have taken up a case of Mrs. Dalloway particularly. Published in 1925, Mrs. Dalloway is often considered to be a modernist text with its free indirect style, the use of a stream of consciousness in a controlled manner. The setting in the context is of the post First World War British society. It also tells us about the changes which have taken place in the British society after the war, loss of lives, the devastation which has been unfolded, the economic condition, the deterioration, the psychological effects of war, the trauma, the grief, the loss of life and changes which it entailed particularly for women. The themes which have been taken up in Mrs. Dalloway are also the themes which interestingly Virginia Woolf has taken up in the rest of her novels too. The fragmentation of identity from the perspective of gender as well as class, the obsession with marriage or the absence of marriage, 
the resultant alienation and loss of meaning as well as the destruction of certain values, the economic hierarchies, the decline of religion and the technological changes in terms of progress as well as in terms of destruction have been repeatedly taken up in her novels. The idea of a stream of consciousness as a technique was taken up by Virginia Woolf in the beginning of the 20th century. The term was coined by William James in 1890 in his treatise Principles of Psychology. So, whereas in psychology it is simply the character of thought or consciousness, we find that Virginia Woolf along with Joyce had used this technique in literature to represent the inner goings on of her characters. It is also a technique which Virginia Woolf and other novelists used to probe deeper into the recesses of the characters to represent the psychological realism. In its predecessors, we can look at the figures like Henry James, Joseph Conrad, May Sinclair or Dorothy Richardson, but let us say that it has been fully explored in the hands of Virginia Woolf and James Joyce. This technique is also different from the interior monologue because it mingles thoughts with impressions and perceptions and also does not follow any logical sequence and takes certain liberties with language also to present the psychological and emotive goings on of a character. The novel is based on a day in the life of Clarissa Dalloway and whose character has been explored and whose identity formation has been laid bare before us with the use of this technique. Clarissa Delloway has tried to understand her own experiences of the world in which she has occupied so far a superfluous position. She has an upper class stature simply because on the basis of her, man, of her marriage to Mr. Dalloway. Uh, she feels that her gender has marginalized her and she has been a dispensable person, a used body. The society has given her only two roles, that of a mother and that of a wife. And she experiences a moment of shock when she meets with you, becomes aware of her decaying body, her mortality, the limitations of her gendered identity. In the course of the novel, we find that Clarissa Dalloway attempts to reformulate her identity by revaluing her past decisions and her relationships with people in her life. For example, her insecurity of losing her selfhood when she chooses to stay with dependable Richard Delloway instead of marrying Peter Walsh who was perhaps you know more demanding. Uh, her consciousness broods over moments in which she paradoxically defines herself simultaneously as very young and at the same time unspeakably aged. We find that the process of identity formation based on one's gender choices has been given in detail. The inner vacuity which is present in a woman's life, the compulsions which she has to take up on the basis of playing her societal roles like throwing a party etc are laid bare in the character of Clarissa Delloway. Interestingly, we find that these attempts are duplicated to a certain extent and are also valorized in the character of her daughter Elizabeth Delloway, a 17 year young girl whose beauty is being noticed. But we are told by Virginia Woolf that she also has started to have uh, certain aspirations in terms of her career. So, we find that whereas through the character of Clarissa Delloway, Virginia Woolf has presented how gender played a very significant role in the formation of her identity. In the character of Elizabeth Delloway, we are being told how the changing societal circumstances and the world view has enabled Elizabeth Delloway to think in a slightly different way about the gender choices which have been given to her. In Mrs. Dalloway, we find that through the portrayal of Clarissa Dalloway, Virginia Woolf has told us how the role of class and gender is important 
for the formation of identity. And this aspect is further contested and elaborated on with the character portrayal of Miss Kilman. Miss Kilman, who unlike Clarissa Dalloway, is marginalized in terms of gender, class and ethnicity. So, the challenges which she has to face in her life have been portrayed because of these different ways in which identity is constructed. So, we find that with these three major characters, Virginia Woolf has presented this idea that gender is a main focus for our identity formation as it exposes women to a particular process of conditioning and it also tells them to choose from the given hierarchy. So, we find that issues related with marriage, lack of choices therein, societal pressures to choose a particular type of a person for marriage, absence of economic independence in contemporary British society are the topics and themes which have been repeatedly taken up by Virginia Woolf to discuss how this issue of identity formation takes place. We also find that her expository writings are more advanced and though she has raised several issues in her novels which formulate and frame a gendered identity for her women characters, not all the ideas which she has presented in her expository writings have been truly reflected in her novels. The repetition of these themes can be seen in Jacob's Room through the presentation of Betty Flanders. In the waves, when Susan practically muses about this concept of marriage through Catherine in Night and Day and also through Lily Briscoe into the lighthouse. When we look at the themes taken up by Virginia Woolf, we find that in certain other major novelists and certain other representative novels of a particular time zone, similar issues have been taken up. When we look at the novels of Jane Austen or Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte or George Eliot, we find that these women novelists were struggling with the concept of marriage and how they were obsessed with it because the contemporary society did not give them any other viable alternative. So, how marriage was a compulsion and women were struggling to escape this compulsion and were unable to find a way out. So, we find that even though the awareness of a gendered situation is very much there in these women novelists, the constraints of the contemporary society are also discernible in them. In the next module, when we would take up Shashi Deshpande, we would find how in the novels of Shashi Deshpande, because of the passage of time, certain constraints have been done away with, but still we find that certain commonalities are very much there. Thank you.